probably so small you can't read anything, but um, quick little background, just you know a little bit more about me. Currently coaching at University of Wisconsin River Falls, as you mentioned. Um, I've been all over the country. Uh, I've been blessed to coach Team USA uh, two times, and I've been invited uh, to coach in Germany uh, for the Thorpe Cup this upcoming summer. So looking forward to that. Um, I coached Division One for about 22 years. I've been coaching Division Three. This is my third season, and I ran Division Two. So I've had experience at all the different divisions, um, and was honored to be named uh, the South the Division One South Region Coach of the Year, which. I thought it was amazing because it's Florida and Alabama and Florida State and those other people and I got this honor, which is, I, I don't know, it's humbling. It, <laughs> I don't understand how I got it, but, and then 18-time uh, conference coach of the year. Um, so being able to have a little success there. I've had a lot of fun uh, being able to uh, be the personal coach of athletes that have competed at every championship level from the Olympics on down, which is not a testament to me, it's a testament to them. Um, I'll tell everybody I find it much easier to coach uh, your professional athletes, your highly skilled athletes, because they learn a lot quicker, they're naturally more gifted. Um, you guys have the, the real coaching, the hard coaching of you know, trying to bring on along those developmental athletes, I think takes a lot more coaching ability uh, than coaching a great athlete. Um, I'm big on coaches education, I love being here um, to be able to share my knowledge with you, the different things that I've learned, um, you know, the mentors that have, that have blessed me and advanced my career, and I just like to be able to give back with that. Um, for the U.S. Uh, Track and Field and Cross Country Coaches Association, I helped write uh, part of the curriculum for the master certification. Um, helped write part of the speed uh, or the sports science for that, and then uh, was blessed to present that as well. Um, I've done the World Athletics um, Elite Sprint Coach certification, all the USATF certifications. So I just love to learn and continually learn, and that's why I love coming to clinics like this. And you know, if I can pick up one little nugget from it, I consider it a big success and, and very enjoyable. So hopefully I'll have some things for you guys um, that you can take from this and, and get you excited to design some training going into your season. Um, I just wanted to quickly mention, you know, I, I've been blessed to have several mentors uh, and, and influences on my coaching career. Um, so I just, I'm not going to take the time to read through all the names, but I just want to give them credit. Um, a lot of this information that I'm sharing with you, I've learned from them. Um, so I don't want to make it seem like uh, I'm taking credit for that. Um, so the topics that we'll go over, um, we're going to talk about you know one coach and how, how one coach can uh, influence or control the experience for training an athlete in multiple events. Uh, we're going to talk about the biomotor abilities, um, how to fit everything in um, when you're trying to coach multiple events, um, grouping considerations to make the, those, that training more effective. Uh, go through a couple of sample cycles of training, talk a little bit about strength training, training design, principles of training theory, and then I ran out of time last time, hopefully I'll talk faster this time, we'll talk a little bit about motor learning and some cueing um, that can help the athletes learn a little bit faster. So, one coach, I, I'm a big fan in uh, one coach doing everything, now that's certainly not possible in many cases. Um, I, I like to be able to coach the athlete rather than coach the event. I think when you have one coach that's overseeing the process, um, they're, they're using similar cues between the events, um, which can help the athlete learn the events faster. Um, and then, then everything is also flowing together seamlessly versus if you send them over to the sprints coach and they run them in the ground, now they send them over to the jumps coach and they try to do technique work when they're exhausted and they can't do any technique to save their life. Um, so if you have one coach overseeing the whole process, coaching the athlete rather than just the event, I think it can be a much more effective situation for the athlete. Again, I realize that in many cases this is not an option, it's not possible. Um, so then I think uh, the next best scenario would be for one coach to oversee the process rather than just sending them to the different event coaches. If there's one coach that at least kind of designs the training and, and schedules when they're going to go and where, um, if they need to focus on sprints on one day, focus on sprints one day. But if they're going to do some jump technique, they're going to do some skill work, some throws skill work. They should probably do that before they go and do their hard sprinting. And if you have one coach overseeing the whole process, then you can and lay that out for them to make sure you're not working against yourself or having the various coaches work against each other um, because they're all trying to get the maximum for that kid. Um, and lots of times I'll see that with you know, a, a throws coach, they get to coach their throwers you know, five days out of the week and they get this combined event kid maybe one day <laughs> out of the week and they're trying to get everything packed in for a week you know, for this one athlete, and then, but then that's going to ruin the other events that they might be trying to train. So, um, again, if you have one coach overseeing the whole process, they can help uh, keep it keep the athlete from getting overcooked. 
Um, so with that, lots of times we don't know the other event areas, right? Um, one of the reasons I love coming to clinics like this is I'll go and, you know, if throws is my weaker area, I'll go and sit and I'll listen to all the throws lectures and I'll try to develop myself in that. And lots of times when you're learning, uh, maybe it's some different rhythms of the throws or some cues of throws and you, it all, all of a sudden click in your head and the light bulb will go off. You know what, that's very similar to the triple jump, just, you know, throwing an event out there. Um, so it might give you an idea um, of how you can better coach another event by learning uh, a various event. So, uh, you know, I think it's even if you don't know all the events, I, I still think coaching the athlete is more valuable and just get out there and educate yourself and, and learn sometimes with the athlete. Um, so maybe you're going over to the throws practice and you're learning from your throws coach um, as, as you're coaching your athlete and watching the feedback and um, just helping yourself grow. Um, and then at the bottom there, I already have the example I gave. You know, don't do the work if you, if you have a tempo running or you have a sprint workout. Don't do that before the technique work. Um, that's just going to mess the athlete up. You, from your warm up in your training session, you should go from a warm up, then you should do any technique work, then you should do any speed work, then you should do any strength work, then you should do any stamina work in an ideal kind of flow of the order of how those uh, different things should be trained. Um, but lots of times we feel like we need to get the work in, so we go and work the athlete hard. They got no legs left, and then they send them over to do the skill work, and they're just not going to be able to learn the skill. It's going to be a very poor uh, motor learning situation. Um, so we want to make sure that we're addressing all five of the basic biomotor abilities, and we want to be doing this at all times of the year. Um, a lot of times people will call it the five S's because it's a little bit easier to remember that way. Skill, speed, strength, stamina, and suppleness. Um, and then any other skills or things that we're training are a combination of those. So agility, the football player is doing an agility shuttle run, that would be a combination of skill or coordination and speed. Um, so, but these are the five basic biomotor abilities that we want to make sure that we're addressing at all times of year. Um, skill can also be thought of as a technique or coordination. Um, speed, a lot of people don't really think about it, but speed can be strength training. Um, if you go and you do a heavy set of squats, how many people are sore? Pretty much everybody, right? <laughs> if you go out and you sprint really hard, how many people have sore hamstrings? Pretty much everybody. Um, so you are strengthening the muscle, you are strengthening those tissues by doing speed work. So sometimes, I think that's just a, a it's not necessarily in line with the biomotor abilities, but I think it's just a nice tidbit to pick up is that speed work lots of times is strength work. Um, you know, speed work can be done with the implement weights that you're using. So for ladies, instead of using the 4K shot, maybe using the 3K shot, now they're able to go over speed. They're able to throw that shot with a greater release velocity. Um, so that can be a way that you can do speed work with a thrower. Um, in the weight room, obviously, very easy. You know, if we're doing starting strength, we're using around 30% of your max. How fast can I accelerate that bar? How quickly can I get that bar to maximum speed? Um, so pretty easy to address in the weight room. Um, and then our speed mechanics we'll talk about more later on. Uh, Strength work, you know, there's a lot of different types of strength work. We have general strength, which is just the ability to control your body in space. Um, we've got speed strength, which I said is, you know, how quickly can I, how soon can I get that bar moving to maximum speed? We have rate of force development. Those in the weight room are usually going to be more your kind of 70 to 80 percent of max type of uh, efforts or intensities. So it's not maximum intensity, it's a little bit lower, so it's heavy weight, but you're still able to move that fast. So it's gonna take you a little bit longer to get that bar to start moving, but the goal with the rate of force development is, is how fast can I ultimately get the bar moving um, with having that little bit heavier weight. Of course, we have max strength, just you know, what's the absolute heaviest weight that I can move regardless of how long it's taking me to move it. Um, but looking at um, you know, the biomotor ability of strength and at what time of year am I doing different types of strength, because we should be doing some form of strength training year-round. Um, and again, strength training could be pulling a sled, it could be running the hill, right? That's going to be strength versus just sprinting on a flat track. So a lot of different ways to think about strength and to apply that, but again, we should be applying that year-round. Stamina, um, it, it fits in nicely with the S's. Per personally, I prefer to use the term work capacity. Um, when working with speed power athletes, we need to look at what are our key performance indicators. Okay, and aerobic endurance has nothing to do with any speed power event. Um, you are going, it's going to be a byproduct. You're going to have some aerobic fitness that happens as a byproduct. 
because you recover using your aerobic system from sprints. You recover using your aerobic system from jumps, from doing the weightlifting, all that type of stuff. So any aerobic development should be um, just a byproduct of the training that you're doing um, for the speed power event. So a lot of times people think stamina, they think, oh, three mile run. Um, that's gonna make your speed power athletes worse. It's gonna inhibit their development as a speed power athlete. So that's why I like to use the term work capacity. Um, so if you've got a jumper and you need a, a work capacity of being able to jump, you might have them do a lot of pogo jumps. It's a low intensity plyometric activity that you can get a big volume of that to build a base that is specific to a jumper as opposed to going out and running three miles that is gonna make your jumper jump worse. Um, now that said, a lot of times they will get better, um, but that might be despite the training rather than because of the training. It just as they turn 16 from being 15, they just have some natural maturation going on, hormone profiles changing. You know, a lot of times they're gonna get faster, they're gonna get more powerful. So I think recognizing still, you know, did they get better because of the training or did they get better just because they got older? It's sometimes something that's important to look at and consider. Um, with the stamina work, uh, which can be nice for your multi-event athletes. Um, for a jumper, they're taking six seconds to run down the runway, right? You can hold your breath for six seconds. You need no fitness to be able to do that. Um, however, a uh, world-class high jumper might be running their curve coming to the takeoff at about eight and a half to nine meters per second. A world-class long jumper is gonna be taking off a long jump board at 10 to 11 meters per second. If you look at what they're doing kind of in their 150, if they're blasting a 150 fast, it's, lots of times it's gonna be similar velocities to what they're doing uh, at their jump takeoff speed. So I look at stamina work sometimes as special skill work. If you can run a faster 150, now the speed that I'm coming in at takeoff for a jump is feeling easier. If it feels easier, I can have more freedom of movement, I can execute the techniques better. Um, so the stamina isn't for the sake of stamina, the stamina is the sake of being relaxed, um, coming into takeoff, uh, like I said, that, that kind of special skill development. Now, we're not going to go out right away and blast 150s with 20 minutes rest. We're going to build to that, right? So you might start off with 10 times 200 meters with two minutes rest at the very beginning of the season and then taper that down until you're doing, you know, maybe 900 meters of total volume as, as opposed to 2,000 meters of total volume. So sometimes you're going to be hitting some of that aerobic stuff, but just realize Recognize why you're doing it, I think is the most important thing. If, if you're doing it just because you think that they need to work hard, or they need to get tired, um, you're probably not helping them and, and maybe you're getting lucky if they have the success from that. Um, with those biomotor abilities, I mentioned that you want to be addressing all of them at all times of year. You just have to prioritize at this time of year, which is the most important. What do I need to focus on the most? Um, and they can have all varying different, you know, varying levels of uh, intensity or demand within those you know if we talk about uh, skill you know we can talk about coordination being an aspect of skill we can talk about balance requiring coordination right so I will have them do hurdle mobility we'll step over a hurdle hold it for three seconds before walking over the next hurdle if they don't have the, sim the very simple thing of balance they are lacking coordination so you, so you can be doing coordination training and something as simple as just balance work um, so again you can adjust what are, what's your priority for those biomotor abilities and what intensity, density, demand are you gonna have uh, when you're working on those? Okay, so how do we fit it in? Um, teach in everything that you do. Um, if you're doing warm-ups, if you're doing drills, if you're in the weight room, if you're in other events, um, teach, right? We're doing accelerations at almost the end of almost all of our warm-ups. So you have an opportunity to talk about you know, mechanics of acceleration or a jump approach, right? They're the same thing, the jump approach is acceleration. So you, you have the opportunity every single day in your warm up to talk about max, max velocity mechanics, acceleration mechanics, um, rhythms, you know, postures, all those different types of things just in the warm up. In the drills, obviously you're doing the drills for a reason, and <laughs> those apply very specifically, but also you can talk about how does this drill apply to this other event? Um, we'll do run run jumps and we might do it more horizontal on a long jump day and we'll do it more vertical on a high jump day. So it's the exact same activity, but we're just changing the angles, the vertical or horizontal. Um, but again, if you're teaching the athlete, if you're helping them connect the dots through the different drills, um, it's gonna help them learn a lot faster. Um, in the weight room, sometimes we'll get fancy and we'll do some you know, specific things that are similar to the event. So typically, you know, in, if you have a combined event athlete, this probably doesn't apply as much, but if you have a decathlete or a heptathlete, 
um, they have to do the shot put, right? So a lot of times we'll be in the weight room, we'll grab a med ball, and we'll be blasting that med ball at the wall as hard as we can. So we're getting shot put technique in the weight room, and we'll do that in a starting strength format. Um, so it's that you know lower intensity, more speed of movement. So rather than, you don't have to just do bench press all the time, right? So we're getting that, that bench press, that push work um, in something specific to an event. So getting creative in the weight room can help them learn the events faster and give you another just teaching opportunity. Um, so training units within a session are simply the classroom. Um, so if you're doing weightlifting, that's that's the classroom. That gives you the opportunity to teach. So I think sometimes coaches think, well, go do these drills, uh, and they send them off on their own to do the drills because maybe there's not enough manpower to coach them or whatever that is. But just recognize that the that you are the teacher, um, and, and the, the drills or the strength training or the warm up, all these different things are the classroom giving you the opportunity to teach. Um, you want to make sure that you are pairing compatible events and activities. Um, so, for example, acceleration development, or if we're doing block starts, um, that's going to be a very similar position to if you're doing a deep squat in the weight room. If you're doing a deep squat and just roll forward and put your hands on the ground, you're almost in a block position, right? So you can um, pair those different things compatible within that same training. So you can more bang your body, you're getting a better uh, adaptation from the athlete, a better understanding of the athlete of what you're trying to accomplish. Um, we want to look at, uh, or you can look at changing the length of your microcycle. So the microcycle is typically a week long. It doesn't mean you're training for seven days. It can be Monday through Friday and Saturday and Sunday are recovery days. They're off days. Um, but if you have an athlete that does a whole bunch of events, you might change that to a 10-day cycle. It doesn't have to be on a weekly cycle. So, you know, a decathlete, we got 10 events, right? So you could do a 10 day cycle and you could hit a different event each of those days or focus on a different event each of those days. So sometimes just think outside the box of, you know, what is your normal cycle of training, but what could that be? Maybe it's a two week cycle. If, if 10 days is too odd, it ends in the middle of the week, maybe do two week training cycles um, and that allows you to fit things in a little bit more effectively. Um, after, this is hard for coaches because especially coaching multiple events, right? We want to help them. So the throws coach wants them to be as good as the throwers, and they, they give you know a fraction of the time to teach them the throws. So they try and get in as much as they possibly can. Um, but it's important that you get the right amount, right? So the Goldilocks principle, not too little, not too much, but get just the right amount, and it's gonna give them the best adaptation. So as you're trying to fit it all in, make sure that you're not skipping the rest. Because the, the work, you get worse during the work, right? We're fatigued, we're tired, we're not doing as well during the work. We get better during the rest. So it's crucial, no matter what the event is, even if it's just a single event athlete, that you're planning, you're very thoughtful with planning and dialing in the rest and the restoration um, is crucial because, like I say, that's that's the most important thing. That's what makes them better. Um, when you are looking at the work, again, be patient. Give them years to develop. Um, a lot of times we want them to be great for this state championship or to get to this state championship or whatever that is. Um, be patient, give them years to develop because if you overtrain them, they might not super compensate at all. They might get injured and not even get to this point or they might just get back to zero and it's going to take way longer. Whereas if you undertrain them, the yellow line here, you might not hit as high of a peak, but you're still super compensating. You're still improving, you're still adapting, you're still getting better, you're still performing uh, better performances. So you're always better off to undertrain than overtrain. Um, and plugging in that rest is, is crucial, you know, especially with the multi-event athlete when you want to get more teaching and more training in. Um, so some grouping considerations. Um, you want to, this came up very slow, sorry. Um, the, the first grouping consideration that I look at is, is this going to be a, a neural training session or is this going to be a general training session? nervous system is the most important system in our body to train for speed power athletes, right? The nervous system controls how fast your muscles turn on and off, you know, the, it controls recruitment, how many muscle fibers am I recruiting? Um, so the nervous system is it. <laughs> um, I think lots of times we, uh, there's more scientific studies out on uh, energy system training and, uh, you know, aerobic training, lactate training, and all that type of stuff, which applies wonderfully to cross country and distance <coughs> coaches. It has very, very little application to speed power coaches. And there's not nearly as many uh, you know, peer-reviewed studies out there on the nervous system and training and adaptation from the nervous system. So a lot of it's more so this type of thing, right? The, the, you know, the experience of other coaches and, and how do we train it and how much and um, how do we recover that type of thing. But 
Um, the nervous system is the most important thing for us to be training as, as coaches of speed power athletes. Um, so with that general versus neural training, we either want to be training the nervous system or we want to be recovering the nervous system um, so that you can train it again another session or another day. Um, within that, make sure that you never let power output levels drop. So if you're doing a neural training session, we're doing a speed session, everything in that training session should be high neural intensity. Um, um, if, the, if the intensity, if the power output begins to drop, be careful, is your workout changing from what you intended it to be? If you planned on doing speed development with 90 meter sprint float sprints, and their speed is dropping, the last 20 meters they're getting slower, well now it's turned in no longer a speed workout, it's now a stamina workout. Okay, so we're now potentially starting to train energy systems, different things like that. So maybe you had 90 sprint flow sprint, you might need to change that to you know, a 60 sprint flow sprint, 20, 20, 20, instead of 30, 30, 30, just as an example. There's all different ways that you can adjust that, but if you see those power output levels drop, you need to simplify um, the activity in order to keep the power output high. If they're just too trashed for whatever the reason is, you might just end that sprint training and you might go, if you had that followed up with some, some pogo training or some plyometric training, you might just move on to that next activity that's a little bit lower neural demand. Um, but they're able to do that at the highest quality that that calls for for that event. So make sure you're keeping that power output up. Um, again, grouping considerations, you, it's important to look at rhythmic considerations. Lots of times we'll train two, maybe three events within a training session. Um, so you, but you need to make sure that you're not working against yourself because that's gonna, if, if the rhythms are opposite each other, you're gonna really confuse the athlete and they're gonna have a hard time having adaptation. And as an example of that, long jump and triple jump shouldn't, ideally, should not be trained on the same day in the same session because they're totally different. Long jump, you're, you're setting that quad, you're stiffening that leg and you're bouncing off that board almost using your leg like a pole vault pole, right? That's an acyclic activity coming to take off. Whereas triple jump, you're stepping over. I'm sure a lot of you use the cue to run off the board. So it's a totally different takeoff, which means it's a different rhythm coming into takeoff. And if you're trying to teach those two in the same day, a lot of times it's very confusing. If you want to experience it for yourself, try to do some <coughs> skipping activities and then do like some run, run jumps or some continuous bounding activity. You, you, it's gonna, you're gonna be confused. It's gonna take you a while to kind of switch your brain over to doing a, a bound from doing a skip or do a skip after doing a bound because those rhythms are very different. So taking a look at the, the rhythms and, and what rhythms pair well together versus what work against each other is really important um, to get the most bang for your buck from those multi-event athletes. So example, uh, long jump and hurdles will typically pair pretty well. You know, the hurdles, your rhythm is one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Um, similarly with that long jump, you're coming in, you're getting faster than boom. You got that same rhythm on those last two steps setting up that long jump takeoff or even a pole vault takeoff to a degree. So those things are, are going to frequently pair with each other pretty well. Um, or high jump and, and javelin is going to be coming in fairly similar. You're going to have a big impulse step and then hitting that stiff block leg, similar to, to high jump coming in and hitting that stiff block leg to bounce off it to go high. So I know we don't have javelin in, in Minnesota, but just another example of some things that could potentially pair well together. And, and you can just use your creativity in your eye and your ear. What, what rhythms are you seeing? What are you hearing? What, what events are going to train well together and complement each other? Um, and this, again, is one of those areas that I think it's very valuable. If you have one coach coaching the athlete in the hurdles and the long jump, right, you got your, rather than your sprint hurdle coach, your long jump coach, if you're connecting the dots for them because you're coaching the athlete and you're talking about, hey, these rhythms pair up, you, can you feel this? They're going to learn and they're going to pick up those multiple events. They're going to pick up those skills faster. But if they're sent out different directions, lots of times those dots might not be connected. So that's a, just a, an example of why I think it's, more valuable if you can have one coach coach the athlete rather than sending to various event coaches. Um, or get together in a staff meeting and talk about, hey, we're doing this, let's make sure that we're both queuing on this and we're both teaching this um, so that everybody's on the same page. So rhythms are something that's good to look at when you're grouping things for a training session. Uh, amplitude of motion is another one. So um, lots of times if we're doing block work, we're doing acceleration work on a Monday, I kind of gave the example, if you just roll forward, and put your hands on the ground from a deep squat, your, your posture, uh, your depth, your amplitude of motion is very similar, you know, in the knee joint, in the hip joint, those type of things. So um, lots of times on, on Mondays, if we're doing acceleration work, we're doing block work, we might be doing our, our deeper squats um, or our, our cleans, you know, starting from the floor or cleans with a deep catch or those different type of things. So um, we have a similar amplitude of motion. Contrarily, 
maximum velocity, you have a very slight bend in your knee when you're in ground support and ground contact. Um, so that's going to be more similar to a four or a six inch step up. Or an above knee snatch is going to be it's more similar knee and joint angles to maximum velocity sprinting. So looking at what are we doing as far as our amplitude of motion in the events that we're doing and how can I have similar amplitudes of motion in all the things in that training session. Um, another valuable one to look at is coupling time. So um, how long are you on the ground? What is, what is your ground contact time? Um, a clean from the floor is going to have a longer coupling time than above knee clean, right? You're gonna, it's going to be a longer activity. You're pushing against the floor longer in that clean. Block starts is going to be the slowest push, the longest ground contact time of an entire 60 or 100 dash or, or whatever that is. Step one is going to be the next slowest. Step two is the next slowest, right? Because you, you get faster with every step up until maximum velocity. So acceleration development um, is going to be a longer coupling time which is going to pair better with cleans or, or squats or, or shot put if you got a multi-event athlete. Uh, uh, shot put, you got some resistance there you have to overcome, so it's going to be a longer coupling time than like discus or javelin, for example, which is a way lighter weight and a much faster velocity. Um, but, uh, or, you know, max velocity um, in doing pogo jumps. Max velocity, you're on the ground, 0 0.083 seconds. Um, so stuff in the weight room is much longer. <laughs> Um, then 0 0.083 seconds. Um, so you might be looking at doing pogo jumps or some different things like that, that you're, you're bouncing off the ground with a much shorter contact time. Or if you're doing hurdle hops, <coughs> drop those hurdles all the way down so that they can get off the ground really fast. Don't, don't, a lot of times we think harder is better, right? Let's put those hurdles as high as we can to do hurdle hops, but that's gonna make them just be on the ground longer. So that might be appropriate for if you're doing acceleration development on Monday, those longer ground contact times, go ahead and crank your hurdles up a little bit for hurdle hops. But if you're doing speed and you're looking at short ground contact times, drop those hurdles down and really cue them. Bring the same 100% effort, but focus on speed, focusing on getting off the ground rather than focusing on how high I can go. Um, so the coupling times can be very valuable in how you're looking at those and how the athletes adapt to the training you design. Um, it's also valuable looking at direction of force application. Um, so acceleration development or approaches is going to be a little bit more horizontal. Um, that might pair with uh, short run jumps. So if you're doing eight step long jumps, and when I say eight steps, I mean eight total steps, not eight laps. Um, but you know that's going to be a, more of a horizontal because you're accelerating for those eight pushes, and the, the long jump obviously is a more horizontal event than the high jump. So that might pair nicely, um, and that might pair nicely <coughs> with doing some standing long jumps and some standing triple jumps as kind of a plyometric to follow up. You know your skill work, your acceleration development, your neural work. So all those things are paired together neuromuscularly, right? That they're all high intensity activities, um, but they're all working a little bit more horizontally in nature. Alternatively, maximum velocity. Once you're at maximum velocity, you can't run any faster. So pushing backwards against the track is gonna only inhibit you and actually make you slower because you're gonna get in a bad posture and bad running mechanics, but you have to overcome gravity, okay? So maximum velocity, you should be pushing down with every step. Um, so that's going to be a vertical action there. Pogos, you're going to be bouncing. Like, think about a pogo stick, right? It's a, it's a vertical activity. Um, so pogos can pair well with that. Hurdle hops are going to be vertical, so that's going to pair well with that. High jump is going to be a vertical takeoff. Um, so that can, so all those different things can potentially pair together pretty nicely in the tra same training session, looking at your direction of force application. And you probably have some athletes who, man, they're a phenomenal jumper, but they can jump really well long and triple, and they can't high jump to save their life. Um, there's a pretty big difference in, in having a vertical takeoff, a vertical force application versus a horizontal. And I mean, I, I see it, I'm sure you all have seen it with athletes too. They, they have the aptitude to do one and not the other, but I think just even as, as general training as you move throughout a, 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 a training career, developing those general abilities, let's, maybe you're not very good at vertical, but let's teach some vertical and let's make you a better, well-rounded athlete, um, having some ability to do that. Um, another group in consideration, look at your duration of power output. So again, lots of times on Mondays, uh, my, it's more of a stim day for me. So Wednesdays typically are when we're going to really hammer some quality speed work. So Monday and Wednesday for me are going to be very high intensity neuromuscular days. Um, but Wednesday is going to be a more extended um, duration of power output. If we're doing, again, a 90 meter sprint full of sprint, that might be taking 10, 11 seconds. Um, versus on Monday, if we're doing acceleration development, that might be taking three or four seconds. 
So pairing Monday, doing standing long jumps, standing triple jumps, five bounds, those type of things, that might be kind of that three to five second range of power output, whereas I might do a, a more uh, extended duration of power output with that max velocity work that's taking 10 or 11 seconds. I might do straight leg bounds, you know, for 40 or 50 meters after that as our plyometric activity. So a little bit, you know, we're pairing that duration of power output. And that's gonna be, the longer duration of power output is gonna be way more strenuous on the nervous system. It's gonna require some more recovery. Um, so I think that's something to be aware of and, and um, plan in as well. Um, and then I kind of touched on long jump being uh, an acyclical, act acyclical activity versus triple jump, which is more cyclical. So you, you don't wanna pair them together if they don't match. Um, you know, being cyclical versus acyclical, because that's gonna either work together and help you, or it's gonna work against each other and, and frustrate the athlete. They're probably gonna leave the training session a little bit frustrated because they took forever just to figure out how to do what you're asking them to do. Um, So I'm going to try to kind of show you guys how I'll go through designing some training. So here is uh, basically where I'll start with a, and I'm sorry, I'll, I'll kind of tell you what it says on there, but here's where I kind of, I will start with a uh, training plan when I'm writing training. Typically on Mondays, so I'm, I'm going to look at, first of all, the end of the week, so let me scroll down, because that's when our competitions are going to be. So this was actually was laying out this training cycle, so this is today. Um, so this is how I started laying out the training cycle that's going on right now. So this is for uh, one of my athletes that's going to the U.S. Indoor Championship, um, she'll be competing Sunday. So I, I plug in, first of all, the competitions, and then I'm going to work back from there. It's gonna be the same thing with the annual plan. I'm gonna plug in the state championship and I'm gonna work back to the conference championship and maybe true team and I'm gonna you know, work my season from the, where I wanna to get to. I'm gonna use the annual plan as my roadmap. I know my destination is a state championship or a conference or whatever that is for that particular athlete and I'm gonna build my roadmap to get there. So when I do the um, mesocycle of training, which this is a three week mesocycle of training, I'm gonna look at you know, where's our competitions and then how do I need to structure my week based off of when the competitions are, right? Sunday's gonna throw things off a little bit because we're used to competing on Saturday or, or Friday, Saturday. Um, but the first thing I'm gonna plug in is, is it a neural session or is it general, okay? So obviously competition at US Indoor Championships is a, a neural activity. We're gonna do a light neural stim the day before because I don't want her feeling flat going into competition. I want her feeling energized, right? A little electricity ready to go. So, it's gonna be a very light stim day, but we're gonna do a neural session prior to that competition. Um, the day before that, we're gonna do a very light general day. Just, um, and actually, I changed it and I gave her totally up. <laughs> so we use that day to freshen her up, but then after um, having an off day, you don't want the systems all shut down, right? The nervous system, you, you probably had it where a Sunday you laid in bed all day, and then when you do it, you just feel weak and lethargic, and. So when you give athletes time off, you need to keep in mind not to do, not to do it too extreme or too rapid um, because then they can feel lethargic and yeah, they're fresh, but they're not ready to perform because they're not stimmed up. So that's where this, this stim day is here to make sure that the systems are turned on. Um, so this ends up being an off day. And then if we scroll up, we have a general day before that off day. So we recover because we want to have a tiny peak you know, indoor, we're not trying to, Olympic trials are way more important than <laughs> indoor championships, um, but we do want to be able to perform well. So, you know, we are unloading this week, but so we went with the general day and then we alternated. We did a neural, a speed, long neural session. Now it's pretty low total volume because we're trying to unload. This is the third week of the cycle, which makes it a low week for us. Um, you can see it's a low week here. Um, so we're gonna do a neural, 
little bit shorter session. We're gonna do some acceleration development work. We're doing some short hurdles, three hurdles, um, that type of thing. And then we're doing a general session, which we're gonna go pretty heavy on that general session because the general can promote recovery. Um, and then we're gonna come back to that longer uh, speed neural session. So I'll just start by going each day and plugging in, you know, is it gonna be neural, is it gonna be general? Is it gonna be a, a shorter acceleration type of theme or is it gonna be a longer speed or speed endurance type of theme? You know, what's the theme of that day? Um, and like I said, the biggest thing that I will work off of is it, is it neural versus general? And then I'll look at my other grouping considerations after that. So from there, the next stage that I went to, obviously you can see we, we still have the, the meats plugged in there and everything. But I'm starting to plug in a little bit of detail. So um, I actually train her. She's the uh, American record holder in the decathlon. Um, so I train her for the decathlon. Even though she's doing a pentathlon, they don't have the decathlon indoor, obviously. So she's doing a pentathlon at US Indoor Championships. Um, but I'm still training her for the decathlon because the outdoor season is, is the more important season. Um, so on the, for her, on the right, I just put, what are these events? As I'm writing them out, I need to think about, okay, which make sure I don't forget an event, right? Make sure I don't forget to plug one in. But if you have an athlete that's going a lot of different directions, they're doing all three jumps and they're doing some four by one work and maybe they run the open 200 or whatever, like you got five, six events to, to think about and, and how do I dress? How do I plug these in there? How do I get them all? So for me, I just need to see it visually. So I just write down the events. What events do we need to be training? Um, and then I'll start plugging in. Okay, this is gonna be a neural day. It's gonna be a shorter sim day. So we're gonna do some acceleration development. We're gonna do shot put because that's a longer coupling time, so I know they're gonna pair well together. And then we're gonna lift um, Tuesday. I know we're gonna be doing a general heavy day. So we're gonna do a little technique work. We're gonna work late acceleration development. So kind of being able to accelerate in upright posture. As you know, they accelerate and they might push for, you know, 10 to 20 meters. They might have some forward lean and then they're pretty much upright, but they're gonna continue accelerating up to about four seconds of time, depending on how far that athlete can cover in four seconds. Um, so it's real easy to work early acceleration, we do it all the time. Working late acceleration is a little bit more tricky. So trying to plug in kind of some, some relatively light skill work, and then we're gonna do some high jump work following that up. Um, after the high jump, so again, we're hitting technique first, then we're doing general strength, some medicine ball work, and then some bodybuilding work. Um, one of the uh, nuggets that you guys can take home is on the general stuff. Uh, when you raise lactate levels, get that little bit of burn in your muscles, your growth hormone levels will shoot up, okay? Growth hormone is a anabolic steroid that's naturally produced within your body. So if you can use some training design to manipulate and get higher levels of growth hormone, your athletes are gonna be more successful. Growth hormone helps the muscles regrow after you've damaged them, right? We work hard, we get sore going to help you recover. Um, so it's safe, it's ethical, it's legal, and it's going to help them perform better, uh, getting this natural steroid effect. And the way you do that is by getting a, a light level of lactic acid. So um, our general strength, our med ball, I get on the athletes, like, keep moving. Quit sitting around, a little bit less talking. <laughs> Let's move from one exercise to the next. Like, I, I need their respiration to be up because if, if they're developing some lactic acid, they're developing a little burn, they're gonna be breathing hard, right? So if they're not breathing hard, I know I need to kick them in the butt a little bit and get them going, because otherwise they're losing this huge benefit. Um, I mean, it's just such a significant benefit to throw away. And then we'll do our core lifting, our, our high intensity lifting, our Olympic lifts, squats, bench, that type of stuff. We're gonna do that in our neural sessions. But on our general sessions, we're gonna do, I'll, I call it bodybuilding. It's not actually bodybuilding. We don't want big bulky people unless they're throwers. Um, but we're gonna do you know, two sets of 10 as an example. We might do 12 exercises, two sets of 10. They're gonna be regional lifts. So it could be curls, it could be leg curls, it could be calf extensions. You know, We're not doing the whole body lifts like an Olympic lift because that demands a lot more of the nervous system. But doing some of those regional lifts, you can get that little burn in the muscle. You could be doing lat pulls. I mean, there's all kinds of different stuff to do just you know, as, as much as your mind can think of. Um, and then you can, you know, again, get that little bit of lactate in the weight room, get that burn going on in the weight room. You're gonna get that nice uh, hormonal benefit, that endocrine system benefit, um, and that's gonna set them up better, help them recover. They're not gonna feel like they're recovering because they got some burn, they're breathing really hard. A lot of times they'll feel like that day was harder than Monday, but the, their nervous system is way easier. Uh, if you've driven 100 miles an hour down the interstate, 
I know I've done that once or twice, and then you throw it on to 70, 70 feels pretty slow. And that's kind of how it is with your nervous system. Monday, we're going 100 miles an hour down the interstate. Tuesday, I slow down to 70%, and to your nervous system, it feels pretty easy, and that allows your nervous system to recover, plus you got that endocrine benefit, um, which sets you up for a really, really good uh, speed session on Wednesday in this particular case. Um, so Wednesday, we know it's going to be a neural day. We're going to do uh, full long jumps. Then we're going to move into our speed development. We're doing our more technique work, moving into our speed development, um, doing some overspeed hurdles, um, and then some uh, short speed endurance in this format with sprint, float sprints, and then we're going to lift. Um, so, and as I'm going through, you can probably see some of the themes of, of what we're trying to accomplish. And when I talk about that compatible training design and grouping considerations, um, just every, every single session that I'm plugging something in, I'm, I'm thinking, how can it group together? How do the coupling times group together? How do the um, rhythms, the range of motion, how do all these things work together, or are they working against each other? So I'll try to make sure I'm plugging that in. Um, you know, so Thursday is going to be a lighter general day, so we're doing some light jab and disc work, following that up with some hurdle mobility, then some general strength, and then some bodybuilding after that. So we're getting some light technique work, we're getting two more of our events in that we need to get in, uh, but then we're getting that range of motion, that injury prevention, that lactate stimulus, all those type of things. Um, we hit another ner light neural day, or short neural day on Friday. Saturday we did, uh, we plugged in the extended work, so uh, she has to run an 800 for the pentathlon, she has to run a 1500 for the decathlon, has to run an 800 for the uh, heptathlon, pentathlon, has to run a 400 for the decathlon, so we need some of that, right? Um, from, if they're just a jumper or they're just a, a four by one person, a horizontal jumper, they don't really need, other than possibly that special skill, they don't really need much uh, repeat runs, tempo running, that type of thing. Um, but if you have a, a true combined runner, <coughs> or, or maybe they're a four by four person for you, right? So you need to have some of that stamina work in there. Um, I'm gonna put that at the end of the week because I want them to have the remainder of the weekend to be able to recover from that so that we can hit the nervous system again, which is the most important thing for us. Um, you, you've all seen 300 hurdlers, 400 hurdlers, you know, the last hurdle or two, they look like a train wreck. <laughs> because the lactate levels have shut off the ability of, you know, it, it literally inhibits the nervous system. So you never want to put that at the beginning of the week because it's going to inhibit the nervous system, which is going to inhibit your speed development. It's going to inhibit your skill development, your technical training. So putting this at the beginning of the week is a good way to ruin the week. You will feel accomplished that you got the hard work in. Um, but it's gonna, it's gonna detract from the more important things of the speed development, the skill development, the strength development, those high neural intensity activities are all gonna be inhibited. And you can see that, like I say, visually, when you watch a 400 hurdler, a 300 hurdler at the end of the race, you can see that nervous system's not working very efficiently anymore. Um, so I'm always putting that at the end of the week so that they have the weekend to recover from that and, and be able to hit another neural session. Um, from there, you can see I'm really getting down in the weeds now. So this is that same cycle of training, and then I'm just plugging in all the specifics. So I'm plugging in what, what shot put work and drills are we doing? What's the exact acceleration development we're doing? So we did three times blocks, 20 meters with an empty sled, 30 meters with 40 meters, two minutes and four minutes rest. We're using the link react time system. Um, you know, we're doing the drills, uh, and then doing 15 to 20 full throws, and then we're going to the weight room um, to hit an intense um, lifting session. So like I say, I'm, I'm not gonna go through all of it, but just plugging in, you know, for me, I was using this open week, and I actually linked some videos for the athletes so they could see what are the what are the javelin exercises that we're doing. Um, so some of them were some new exercises. So I created a, a YouTube channel and uploaded a video, and then I just linked so they can click on their workout and they can pull up the video if they want to look at it before practice time and kind of figure out what they're going to be doing. Um, or I'll demonstrate most things, but if it's something that I'm not able to demonstrate very well, I'll, you know, I'll put, plug in a video for there for them so they can see. But so I'll use. Uh, Again, you don't have to do this, but you can see that like for our late acceleration development, like I've got in centimeters, what are the what are the stride lengths? What's the patterning of that late acceleration development? So a lot of times I'm doing calculations off on the side or down here, I've got what's our discus technique? We're gonna be doing three reps of this, you know, kind of how long is that gonna take? So again, you probably don't have time to get this detailed. Um, but this, this is one of the things that I love about coaching is just getting in there on like a chess game and designing the training and how can we lay this out really effective. Um, so that, that's kind of how I'll, I'll go through that and sometimes I'll 
just plugging little notes from them. We're starting at 2 p.m. on this day, so you can, you know, if you're writing it out and giving them something, and my athletes always have, you know, three to four weeks of, of training, you know, in advance, so they know what's going to be upcoming. They know, yeah, I better eat this day because I know i got a hard workout. Or I better bring some snacks this day because it's going to be a long day, or, you know, whatever that is. I better hydrate, or I better not go out and party Thursday night because Friday I'm getting, you know, getting an onslaught of training. So whatever that happens to be, I think it helps them come prepared, um, ready for a good training session. At least hopefully it does. Um, so let's go back to PowerPoint here. As I'm doing that, does anybody have any questions offhand? I'm real boring or I'm thorough. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so I kind of look at some sample cycles and just kind of how I'll lay out training. Um, so then looking at strength training, I already talked kind of the neural versus general. The general, you know, we're kind of doing that bodybuilding, trying to get that endocrine stimulus. Um, so that's another opportunity for your multi-event athlete. Um, you got the pulley machines, you know, they, or the rope for like the tricep push downs. A lot of times I'll have them grab the rope in that pulley machine, and they're going to be right here getting some jab blocks, working the flexibility <laughs> through that arm, but also you're working a little bit of the strengthening, you're working that motor patterning. There's so much teaching you can do just you know, on jewelry. So I've got bodybuilding, which is going to be your more basic curls, leg extensions, whatever, whatever. And then I have special bodybuilding, which is going to be more tied in specifically to their events and just different things that I can kind of dial in, regional things um, that are going to help them learn the event better. I get another opportunity to teach in their classroom to teach in. Um, so I'll like, you know, for uh, high jump, you know, we'll, we'll have them hang from the squat rack with a dip belt around them and the weight hanging down from that. I call them uh, hanging Russian hamstrings. I can't do it here because I can't hang, but you'd basically be belly up. You'd be in a relatively horizontal position, hold hanging from the squat rack, and you're pushing down firing the glute to push the leg down into you know, a partner's shoulder. So you're hanging from the squat rack, your partner's holding their foot on their shoulder, they got a weight belt around them and a weight hanging down, and they're trying to pop their hips up by pushing their foot down through my shoulder. So that's very similar to that takeoff, an active takeoff, firing the glute into a long jump takeoff, into a high jump takeoff, whatever that is. So we can cue about hey, when you come in, I need a stiff quad, I need you actively firing that glute, I need an active takeoff, and this is going to apply, and you can tell them, this is going to apply to long jump, this is going to apply to high jump, tell them how it's going to apply, where it's going to apply, uh, but you can plug some of this type of thing into some special bodybuilding and that type of stuff, and so you can get a little more technique dialed in um, as you're getting that endocrine benefit and a little bit of just general strength development at the same time, so a lot of bang for your buck. Um, Talk a little bit, so in the fall, or in our preparatory period, it doesn't necessarily have to be the fall, but in our preparatory period, typically Monday I'm doing a uh, shorter neuromuscular session to kind of stim them up for that Wednesday uh, higher intensity day. So in the weight room, a lot of times we'll do starting strength, which is usually going to be around 30% of their max. So we're trying to move the bar as fast as we possibly can. So it's not going to be, they're giving 100% effort, but because it's lightweight, the bar is moving fast, it's not that demanding on the nervous system. We're able to recover very easily and be stimmed up for that Wednesday session that we really want to get after. Rate of force development, we'll usually plug in on Wednesday after our speed development session. Um, and rate of force development work is that kind of 70 to 80% of your max. Um, so it's, it's not max, obviously, it's, it's sub max, so you're able to move the bar faster, and we're trying to get them to move the bar as fast as possible. So heavier weight's going to take them a little bit longer to get that bar moving. But as that bar is getting moving, how fast can they get the bar moving? So really focusing on that. And then uh, the end of the week, we're going to follow that, that stamina session where they hate me and they're already puking. And then we're going to go in the weight room and we're doing max strength. And they're going to hate me even worse. Um, but I want that at the end of the week because it's least specific, right? It's those slowest coupling times. Um, you know, it's that if you're doing one rep in a squat that's near max, it might take you five seconds to push that squat. Well, you know, you're on the ground for 0 .083 in a sprint. You know, so those don't line up at all. So, but the stamina work, you know, sometimes it becomes a little bit of a death march. Not that you want it to, but sometimes it does, and there's longer ground contact times. You see them. Um, so going in and doing that max strength afterwards. But then, like I say, having that weekend to recover from it so you can come back and get some more quality neural training, at, you know, early that next week uh, is the idea behind that. If you do that max strength earlier in the week, you might get that strength development, but, but you might be inhibiting a lot of other things. Um, plugging that a little bit too early. So I kind of do that order. 
uh, in the, the preparatory period, and I find that works very, very well. And then when we get in the competition period, I'll do a hybrid, and lots of times I might have all three in the same thing. So I might have, you know, they do, let's say, five sets of four on the bench press, and then they're going to have a partner stand there, they're going to pull a bunch of the weight off the side. So there's still going to be a little bit of weight, but not much, and then they're going to rep out six as fast as they possibly can. Um, so we're kind of, you know, maintaining that max strength, but we're also hitting that starting strength in the same session, kind of a superset type of exercises. Um, or we might do some cleans. Five minutes left? Oh, man. <laughs> I better start talking a lot faster. Um, but so, I'll, anyways, I'll do kind of a hybrid session um, during that time. Um, I'm going to blow through this so I can try to get the, at least get the information in your ears. Uh, the presentation is being videoed, so you'll be able to look at it, and you can go back and get the PowerPoint, and you're welcome to ask any questions anytime. But for the training design, big picture, I'll typically go short to long. Uh, Three-mile runs that I already talked about, don't do them. Um, with that stamina work, we'll go long to short, but that's looking more so at the total volume of the training session. So 10, 200 is like 2,000 volume. To me, that's gigantic volume for a jumper, um, and that volume is going to drop every cycle. Um, of training. And if, if, when you only have three months, it's probably going to drop every week <laughs> because you don't have a full year. I can kind of hit them with a similar volume for a month and then drop it down where you guys got to compress that uh, training schedule. So it's the same philosophy, it's the same training theory, you just have to shrink it down to, to fit your schedule, um, which I already talked about in the next one. Um, we're going to move from general to specific, we're going to move from slow to fast, we're going to do whole part, whole teaching, um, from simple to complex. So we're going to introduce them to the event. Let them experience what is the event, and, you know, what's the point of it, how do I do it? Um, and then, you know, then starting to teach the skills and drills, and then we're going to take those skills and drills and synthesize them back into the whole event. Um, so just as, you, as you're training throughout the season, you're looking at that. Um, and, and you need to do the event. You need to learn the technique within the event because you change the speeds. Skills and drills just teach you some spatial awareness of where some body parts should be. But when you take them out of context of the whole event, you take them out of the approach or the entry or whatever that is, um, it, it's, it's really totally different, and so you got to connect those dots as soon as you can. Um, I do want to talk about this, and I'll try to be quick, but I think this is valuable for you guys. So I put down some possible high school micro cycles. Um, if you want to take a picture of this or whatever, you're more than welcome to. This isn't the way to do it, it's a way that you could do it. So preseason, if you have no competition, you might do Monday, Wednesday as neural days, Friday is an extended neural day, Tuesday, Thursday as general days. Um, and then I gave examples in there, of, and I kind of already talked about them, but different things that you might do on those given days. Um, if you need to know my abbreviations, just let me know and I'll, I'll tell you what those are. Um, one of the hardest things for you guys, I think it's craziness, uh, but competing on Tuesdays and Thursdays, those are two neural sessions, right? So when are you getting your other neural session? <laughs> um, I think that's something that's like a, a trick for you guys to figure out, but um, you could look at Monday as being a light neural stim day, or a, a short neural stim day, it doesn't have to be light necessarily. Competition on Tuesday is gonna be neural, otherwise there's no reason to compete them, right? If they're not giving 100% effort. Um, Wednesday, if you just did two neural days back to back, you better come back with a general day, so you could do some light technique work, um, short run jumps, different stuff like that, plug in some general strength, some injury prevention, some bodybuilding. Um, Thursday is gonna be, you know, if it's another competition, you got another neural session on your hands. And then Friday, try to hit that extended neural session, so um, that could be, um, you know, getting some of that stamina work you need to for your jumpers, that 10 times 200, and I'm throwing that out there, it's, I should probably use a way smaller number, 10 times 120 or something, but, um, so you can get that extended session so that you can come in, have uh, Saturday and Sunday to recover the nervous system and energy systems and everything, and then come back at it. So, a possible setup, um, Saturday competition, I know that happens occasionally, um, you could do, again, Monday, Wednesday is neural, Tuesday, Thursday are general days, uh, Friday a light skin day, and then Saturday, um, go after and get it, because if you're competing on Saturdays, those are usually, I think, your more competitive, your bigger meets um, that you want to be ready to perform, so that can set them up pretty well that way. Um, got two slides left. We have just, okay. So motor learning, um, some things that will help you, help your athletes pick up the skills faster to be able to, to master multiple events faster or sooner. Um, focus on one side of the body and or the top versus the bottom. So if you're coaching a thrower, you might be working on some footwork and just stick to that for that particular session. If you start doing footwork and you're talking about what they're doing with their upper body, their arms, or separation, they're just going to be confused and have overload and it's going to fall apart on them, right? Like a house of cards. So try to keep the focus during that training session, you know, either the takeoff side or the penultimate side. 
Um, if you're trying to do both, again, they're, they're going to have overload and they're not going to be able to get it done. So if you, if you need to do both, save it for the next session. <laughs> um, so look at that. Again, try to have consistency in your queuing, in your teaching. Try not to bounce all over the place. I mean, lots of times, you, you know, let's say you're talking about getting that hip into a throw, um, and then you see, you know, they came over top of the arm or whatever. Well, you might see something real obvious that they messed up on, but rather than jump Q to Q to Q to Q, and they never really have a, a chance to stabilize anything that you're teaching them, try to keep that focus. Okay, your arm fell apart, but you got the hit through that time. I need you to do that again. You know, feel that same thing. So trying to stay focused on what it is you're trying to teach in that session. Um, and that's where those early competitions can give you the cues on this is the thing that falls apart most on them when they start getting under a little bit of pressure and a little bit of stress. So this is what I need to focus my training on. This is um, what I need to be dialed in on. And let the other things go. Not, and they're wrong. <laughs> they need to be fixed. But what's most important to work on, right? And then stick, stick to that for a little bit of time so you get a chance to get it. Um, lots of times the free side will fix the other side. So I'm sorry I keep on using throws as an example. I think myself way more as a Jones coach. But um, you know, if, if, if they're not hitting the orbit here, Right with this left arm, they're probably not going to hit it here. If their arm's swinging down low, they're probably going to come over top and they're going to be throwing that shot foot flat. So a lot of times, you, rather than talking about, hey, push that shot foot up, you might just give them a different cue. Get this left arm up, right? trace the orbit, and that's going to fix the release side. So lots of times, the free side can fix the, uh, the jump side or the throw side or whatever that is. Um, try, again, try to constantly connect the dots for them. Um, a, a stiff block in the javelin is similar to a stiff quad in the takeoff, is similar to a stiff quad in the high jump. Learning to bounce rather than push off the ground in jumps is extremely important. Um, so again, just connect those dots so they learn faster. Um, use similar cues between events, talked about that a lot. Um, in the same cycle, use similar cues between the events, but have alternate cues for when the present cues have lost their effectiveness. So, in the same thing as training, if I just do the same workout over and over and over again, I'm going to prove for a while and then I'm going to plateau and there's going to be no more improvement or there's going to be you know, a decrease. The same thing happens with motor learning. So I have these cues that's working great. I'm excited. They're excited. They're learning some stuff. But you use that same cue and it's lost its effectiveness. Right? It's not going to help anymore. They're going to plateau and then they're going to start getting frustrated. So have cues that you can switch to. Um, from Typically, a cue is going to be effective for about three or four weeks. Depends on the athlete, obviously. Depends on how, many, how much you're working on events. Um, but having a, a plan of, you know, maybe I need to fix this thing, but I'm going to give a different cue to fix it. Or I'm going to focus on the free side to fix it rather than the jump side to fix it. So I'm going to be cueing a different side of the body. So being able to do that and switch um, is real valuable. Um, anyways, you, you can read through the rest of those. Um, and then I had key takeaways, but we already talked about those in the presentation, so hopefully you took them away. <laughs> um, can't necessarily read it because of the lights, but I've got my email addresses up there. You're welcome to email me with any questions that you have. Um, happy to help you, with, whether it's about this presentation or about anything. Um, more than happy to help you however I can. Any questions, real quick?